Okay, so gluconeogenesis, it is almost the reverse of glycolysis, and what the major point of it is that gluco is, and then neogenesis, it's producing glucose. And again, this is really important because we're producing it from a non-carbohydrate source. And so we can produce it from lactate, right, which are amino acids can come into this pathway. And we can go from lactate to pyruvate and then um, go through this pathway. So this is gluconeogenesis. Uh, glycerol could come in this pathway, even some additional amino acids. So again, the, the purpose of this pathway is synthesizing glucose from a non-carbohydrate source. So there's all sorts of different um, precursors for this. The most common ones is lactate, and this is done in the liver uh, within this process. So, and as mentioned in the earlier lecture today, when they come in from different pathways, whether it's glycerol or if it's DHAP, then they're going to go through this process, and the ultimate goal is to produce glucose. And so hopefully you guys remember that from today. The reason this is, is that glucose is not a complete reversal of glycolysis because really there's three irreversible steps that we have to overcome in this process, but we still need to maintain our blood glucose levels, especially when our, our carbohydrate supplies are low. So the major occurrence of this is in the liver and it, account, it accounts for about 90% of our gluconeogenesis in our body. But these are the three reactions that we have to overcome. And if you look at the delta G here, it should not be a surprise as to why we have to overcome them. So we need to overcome the hexokinase reaction, the phosphofructose kinase reaction, and the pyruvate kinase reaction. And again, the reason that this is not just a reversal of glycolysis is because it would be too endergonic in order to do that. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to overcome a couple steps. So the first one we're going to overcome, because if you think of glycolysis going from like top down, right? So gluconeogenesis is going from the bottom up. So if you think about the product of glycolysis, it's pyruvate. So that's the start of gluconeogenesis. So the process, what we have to do is we need to convert pyruvate back into our phosphophenol pyruvate, right? So that's the process. Um, in order to do this, it is a two-step process. So there are two enzymes that are needed to reverse the step that pyruvate kinase completes in glycolysis. So the first one is the pyruvate carboxylase, and the second one is the phosphophenol pyruvate carboxylase, um, carboxykinase, as we go through. So here we're taking pyruvate, we're adding in ATP, we will get ADP, we're adding in water as we go through this, and this is going to form what's known as oxaloacetate. Then the oxaloacetate itself needs to go through a process and it's going to uh, be converted in this process. This time we're adding GTP, so this is a slightly different, it's again just an energy for source, and we're gonna get GDP. And then if you look here at this particular one, um, pyruvate, three carbons, right? We've added a CO2 to get the oxaloacetate, one, two, three, four. That's oxaloacetate. Again, one, two, three, four, oxaloacetate. But uh, phosphophenol pyruvate is a three carbon molecule, so it's CO2. Now, um, as mentioned before, and I want to make sure we all are on the same page, this is going to occur in the mitochondria. Uh, and the reason that is, is I know we haven't talked about it, but oxaloacetate is really important for the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle, and this occurs in the mitochondria. So I know this seems really stupid, um, this process, like why is the cell requiring us to go from oxaloacetate to malate and from malate to oxaloacetate through this process? Um, and the reason it is is that oxaloacetate is a metabolite in two important pathways, not just one. It is actually in the Krebs cycle, which is the way more important pathway than gluconeogenesis in terms of energy output. And so, believe it or not, this is actually stored here in the um, mitochondria, and we need to get it out through this process. Okay, so that is uh, kind of the first step as we go through this process of gluconeogenesis. The next particular step that we need to overcome is we need to overcome going from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, and so this is going to use the fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. 
Uh, and this, this was, again, this is an irreversible step that we have to overcome in this process. And we're going from two phosphate groups down to one phosphate group, and we're uh, releasing an inorganic phosphate in this process. And again, this is in gluconeogenesis. It is also irreversible. It's a one-step process. Okay. So um, last but not least in this process is that we need to, so again, gluconeogenesis, we're kind of going back up. We're trying to produce glucose. Glycolysis is taking glucose and going down. So the last step that we need to overcome is we need to overcome going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. And so the uh, enzyme that we're overcoming, hexokinase, is in glycolysis, and we need to use glucose 6-phosphatase. So what this is doing is um, this particular enzyme uh, is essentially only occurs in this liver, the final step of gluconeogenesis. And that's because we end up taking that glucose and we can either use it in the liver or potentially store it, right? And so the liver is a really important uh, process and that's where this particular step occurs um, through this process. So again, this is the second half of gluconeogenesis. So this is where it would start. It starts with pyruvate and works its way up. The other component that we need to talk about is how this is regulated. So in this particular step, gluconeogenesis and glycolysis are regulated so that within the cell, one pathway is relatively inactive, while the other is highly active. And I think our uh, guest speaker today did a really good job just talking about how um, it's never fully stopped one way or the other but one can be more active. So it's, it's called the reciprocal regulation. So glycolysis is going to predominate when glucose is abundant, so we can convert it into um, our pyruvate. And gluconeogenesis will be highly active when glucose is, is uh, not abundant or, or scarce. So there's really one key step out of all of the different steps that really helps to regulate this particular conversion or regulation of gluconeogenesis and glycolysis. And that is the idea of the conversion of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and fructose 6-phosphate. So this is the key regulatory... Oh, sorry about that. Key regulatory step that's occurring here. So this is what we need to worry about. And so in this particular step, this is the regulatory point, we have um, a particular compound. So fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, um, what it's going to do, this is a regulatory compound. So this compound is not actually part of glycolysis and it's not actually part of gluconeogenesis. It is a regulator of these pathways it's going to do a couple different things. So if we have lots of glucose, then the fructose 2,6-bisphosphatase, phosphate, excuse me, is going to activate the kinase. This kinase is going to be turned on and that's going to allow us to then go through glycolysis. Yay! In gluconeogenesis, what ends up happening is that um, instead of turning on the uh, kinase, what we end up having is it, it's turning off. Um, so this is going to occur. We're going to turn on fructose 2,6-bisphosphate when we have lots of insulin because that's saying there's lots of free-floating glucose and that's going to turn on glycolysis. Glucagon, on the other hand, is going to turn off production of our fructose 2,6-bisphosphate Turning this off, that means we also turned off the kinase. We're not going to produce this, and so it's going to go in the opposite direction. So it's going to produce our um, glucose through gluconeogenesis again. So again, this really is one of the key regulatory factors as we go through. So if we have this, yay, glycolysis. If we don't have it, yay, gluconeogenesis, right, as we go through this process. Um, additionally, within this process, there are some other regulatory steps beyond this. So again, this is called the reciprocal regulation. So if one is turned on, then the other is turned off. Now, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, 
this is, it has that weird kinase phosphatase domain. So even though it's the same molecule, that's why it can turn on and can turn off at the same time. So let's look here at what this is doing. Okay, so we don't, so we have, um, we don't have our fructose bisphosphatase activity here in this particular level. Um, so what we're going to have is we're going to have our kinase activity and then we're going to go through here. If we turn off the kinase activity, then we're going to have our phosphatase activity. So going through this. So if we have abundant glucose in this particular one, uh, it's going to um, signal that we have lots of it. That means we're going to have lots of insulin. That means fructose 2, 6, this phosphate phosphate is stimulated and it's going to stimulate our protein kinase and so what we're going to have is we're going to have um, glycolysis and if our glucose is scarce then our glycolysis is inactivated. For this process. So the only other thing I wanted to mention um, is during exercise or during rest. So we're really looking at kind of um, this pathway whenever we are here at rest. Do we really need glucose? Probably not, right? So what's going to happen is glycolysis is inhibited. So really we have our relaxed muscles. We're probably not going to produce much pyruvate, but to be honest, we don't need much because we don't, we don't need the energy. But during exercise, we're going to stimulate our glycolysis. How can we stimulate our glycolysis? Well, if, we have, if we're missing, if we have high levels of AMP, that means we need more ATP. And so then that's going to activate the kinase, and that's going to go through this pathway. Additionally, if we have lots of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, then we're going to have lots of this activity. So this actually regulates this. So this can upregulate it um, in this pathway. And again, this makes sense because during exercise, you need lots of energy. So glycolysis is stimulated. Let's break down that glu glucose and get that energy as we go through. Um, kind of looking at it, just this is the last figure from your particular text. Uh, this is the control of our catalytic activity of our pyruvate kinase. So pyruvate kinase is regulated by an allosteric effector and covalent modifications. So insulin normally inhibits gluconeogenesis. In type 2 diabetes, though, insulin fails to act. So it's a condition called insulin resistance. So the enzymes of gluconeogenesis, okay, in this particular one, especially um, this... Uh, uh, especially the PEP carboxykinase, are active, and this leads to abnormally high levels of blood glucose. So ex exercise and diet can then enhance our insulin, insulin sensitivity. So normally when we have insulin, it means no gluconeogenesis. We have lots of sugar, but in people with um, type 2 diabetes, our insulin fails to act, and so this is insulin resistance, and so they might actually have activation of their gluconeogenesis when they really don't need it. So then actually that results in higher blood sugar levels and then um, that leads to particular health problems. So in this particular pathway. That's everything. Hopefully that helps explain it a little bit longer and you're able to go back and answer any questions that you may have. If you have any, please let me know. Thank you.